<laughs> and so welcome, Dr. Felicia Goldstein. It's good to have you. Dr. Goldstein has been part of the CEP program, I think since day one, am I right, Dr. Goldstein? Yep. Yeah, you've been part of the whole idea of what happens after a diagnosis of mild cognitive impairment mm -hmm. and that clinical experience of wanting to say, you know, we want you to eat right. We want you to get more social and more active, uh, but we don't have a place to send you. And CEP was the answer to that question. And um, some of the solutions that she's gonna be sharing with you today are reflective of her really distinguished background in neuropsychology. Uh, Dr. Goldstein comes to us uh, as a, uh, not just someone who is dedicated to um, us here at Emory, but she's really dedicated her whole career to understanding cognitive disorders. And her expertise lies in really uh, the complexities of, mental, of memory and executive functioning. So she's gonna be coming to share some of the latest research from The Lancet with us from that perspective. So we're really excited um, with all of your um, background and your experience to get into what's making you excited in the recent publications, Dr. Goldstein. So welcome in. Well, thank you. Thanks, Megan. Um, I see that I'm wearing the same blouse and I am in that picture that you showed me. <laughs> I don't know, I subconsciously coordinated my outfit for the talk today, but um, appreciate the introduction. And what I, as Megan mentioned, what I want to do today is talk to you about some lesser advertised or known strategies that are really critical for improving um, brain health. And, you know, in terms of historical perspective, I've been here since 1989. I'm um, seeing patients at the Emory, uh, originally Wesley Woods, and now over at the Brain Health Center. When I started, there were no medications for people with uh, mild cognitive impairment. There wasn't even a term mild cognitive impairment in 1989, or at least one that we used a lot here. And um, there weren't any treatments or recommendations for what to do with people who were exhibiting cognitive problems. There were some drugs um, that eventually came on the market. The Nepazil Aricep became FDA approved in 1996, um, Exelon in 2000, and Memantine in 2003. So basically our reports if, at that point would say, recommend the treatment trial of Aricep. But we didn't even think back then about the possibility or really consider that there might be some non-pharmacological options for people to engage in that might have a beneficial effect on their thinking. So as Megan again has mentioned, you know, over time we have really learned a lot and there are now evidence-based approaches for treating uh, memory and other disorders of cognition that don't involve drugs. And shown here is just some examples of those. Um, exercise, of course, is, is definitely been shown to be beneficial. Um, menu, uh, mind diet, uh, Mediterranean diet, the importance of cognitive and social stimulation, and also the importance of sleep are all lifestyle interventions and things that now I routinely put in my reports um, when I see people. You know, I know that I'm not just saying to do these things because you know, they may help. We know that they help. There's, there's definitely literature supportive of them. This and slide here just shows you uh, a, an interactive uh, a slide of all the lifestyle factors put together. And these are the ones, of course, that we recommend. We also um, recommend treatment of depression because depression has a big impact as well on cognitive functioning. And at the CEP, as you know, those... Uh, Interventions are taught to everybody. We have uh, five basic domains that we concentrate on. There's the nutrition domain, uh, mind diet. We have uh, exercises, physical activity. Um, I'm involved in the cognitive stimulation training component of the program. There's functional safety and training, and also live well, which addresses stress and depression and other um, sequelae of being diagnosed with mild cognitive impairment. So what I wanted to do today is The Lancet is a very prestigious medical journal um, in our field. It has a very high 
impact factor. And every couple of years, the Lancet does a, a scoping review of the literature with experts on the panel that looks at different things that may be beneficial for cognition. And they only publish after reviewing the literature and coming up with recommendations, only review the ones that really show promise in helping to um, slow down progression, prevent cognition decline, or even prevent early on cognitive dysfunction. And so this came out just recently in August 2024, and there were some interesting ones that they highlighted that we don't often talk about, and that when I mentioned them to patients, um, they're really surprised that these things would make a difference. So I wanted to go over a couple of those, a few of those with you today and highlight those. Um, and what the Lancet published and, and said in this article is that the potential for prevention is high, and overall, nearly half of dementias could theoretically be prevented by eliminating these 14 risk factors. These findings provide hope. Really amazing that almost 50% of dementias, they, this panel of experts found after reviewing the literature could really make a difference in helping people and preventing um, dementia and cognition declining. So this um, schematic or figure is taken from this article. And what it shows is the 14 risk factors they identified as potentially modifiable for Alzheimer's risk. 45% could be, if they, everybody did these, all of these, 45% reduction in risk for dementia is what they estimated. And in the circles are the numbers like um, how much reduction they predicted from each risk factor. The ones I wanted to talk to you today are sensory loss, the importance of hearing and vision for cognitive functioning. They um, found 7% and 2% risk reduction if we simply just treated these things or uh, found some compensatory mechanisms for these. The one that's new this year that they just published for 2024 is the importance of controlling your LDL cholesterol levels. And also I wanted to conclude talking to you about excessive alcohol use. I'm often asked by patients, you know, can I drink? Uh, is it okay to have a glass of wine with dinner? What's excessive? What isn't? What's the literature on this? So I wanted to review a little bit of that with you. And so now let's turn to hearing loss. One of the biggest risk factors for cognitive decline, 7% if we treated our hearing could be, um, the literature suggests we could show a decline in, in uh, dementia. So there is definitely a connection between the severity of hearing loss and um, the dementia risk. There's a dose-response relationship. The greater your hearing loss, the greater your risk for dementia. And about 62% of people who are 50 years and older have hearing loss. It's very common. I have to admit myself that I've, I've, I've noticed myself experiencing some hearing loss, turning the television on louder, having more difficulty on Zoom calls, just noticing that, um, you know, it's time to get that checked out and go for a hearing test. And possibly maybe needing something to help with my hearing, at least in certain situations. Mild hearing loss is two, you're two times more likely to develop dementia from the literature of what this Lancet Commission found. Moderate, three times more likely. Severe hearing loss, five times more likely. So basically why, people's like, what's, what do the ears have to do with the brain? Why, why are those things connected? Well, it turns out there is a connection between hearing loss and cognitive functioning. First of all, if you think about it, if you're concentrating on hearing what someone's saying, you're, first of all, putting all your resources into hearing and not paying attention to anything else going on around you. Your brain is working extra hard just to process what someone is saying to the exclusion of everything else around you. And also, um, if your brain is really working hard, it's, it puts a cognitive strain on you. The other thing about hearing loss is that we know that people with hearing loss 
tend to become socially isolated and they also experience loneliness as a result. They don't, they tend to withdraw a little bit more. They may not want to go out as much, may not want to go to parties or invited dinners, to church, to places where, you know, it's pretty obvious. That, well, first, they're not hearing what's being said and they feel embarrassed by it. So they may withdraw more and more. We know that social isolation and loneliness themselves are risk factors for de um, dementia. And finally, um, there is a connection between hearing loss and the brain. It turns out that um, the research has found that there's an accelerated decline in brain regions associated with language processing and memory in persons with um, hearing loss. So there is a definite connection going on as well in the brain. The other um, thing that the Lancet Commission pointed out, which was interesting to me, and that this was new, uh, they talked about hearing loss previously, but vision loss is also a, a risk factor for cognitive decline. Now, the types of vision loss that have been identified, and I want to stress that this is untreated vision loss. When you can do something, they're not talking about loss due to you know blindness or something that you, is out of your control. They're talking about conditions that may be correctable that you can see a doctor for and at least get some help for. Um, they talked about um, moderate to severe distance vision involved in cognition, difficulty seeing low contrast letters. They talked about macular degeneration, cataracts, diabetes. All these eye-related diseases have been found to be correlated with cognitive impairment. And they said that glaucoma, which is interesting, is not linked to an increased Alzheimer's disease risk. So that was the one condition they didn't note a connection with. Now, again, um, you ask, well, why does vision have anything to do with cognition? It has a lot of um, links, actually. If we're not seeing things clearly, then we are not stimulating our brains as much. We're not letting in all our senses, all the colors, all the richness of the environment. And our brains are not being as stimulated as they might be if we could see well. And vision problems also can exacerbate cognitive difficulties. So when we're not seeing well, we can become more confused and have memory problems. We're more likely not to recognize a familiar person. We may be more likely to get lost in a familiar place. We may find that we're losing things, not because we're forgetful necessarily, but we don't know where we, we don't know where we put it because we didn't see where we put it. That's the difference. So these are vision problems that can cause or exacerbate memory and cause confusion. It's also interesting that they they find a connection between the retina and the brain. It turns out that the retina is also an area where beta amyloid, which is involved in Alzheimer's pathology, builds up. And the more uh, amyloid in your retina, which of course is involved in vision, they also find a correlation with increased beta amyloid in the brain. We are now at Emory and other centers are doing actually, um, and I don't know if any of you have come for exams at Emory or in a, any of our research, but we now are looking at the retina through a, through a special machine that we have in our clinic because that's a mind's eye's view of the brain, really. If you can look at the retina, you can also infer changes that are taking place in the brain. So it's really very interesting uh, research that's being done. <clears throat> so there's a synergistic relationship. About 20% of adults who are 75 and older have both hearing and vision loss. And this is called dual sensory impairment. So if you have both conditions as opposed to one or the other, it significantly increases your risk for dementia and also, of course, decreases your uh, quality of life. And there's this interesting um, studies now going on trying to see whether improving your hearing or your vision actually show benefits for cognition. There's one study called the ACHIEVE study that looked at people who were 70 to 84 years old, who had um, untreated hearing loss. 
And they found that in a subgroup of these people with untreated hearing loss, um, they gave them um, hearing aids. And then they had a control group that did not give hearing aids, but counseled about other things, but they did not wear hearing aids. They found that in the group with the hearing aids, there was a 48% reduction in cognitive decline compared to the control group. And that's pretty striking. I mean, the people with the um, compensatory hearing aids actually did not decline as much as those who were still going around with hearing loss, but it was not corrected. Um, I wanted to talk to you too about the findings. This is new for 2024 on cholesterol. LDL cholesterol is something that I pay attention to when I get my blood work back. I remember it as lousy DL. So lousy, bad cholesterol is how the mnemonic I use for why this one is the one that I really want to focus on in my lab reports. So cholesterol or LDL cholesterol is labeled the bad cholesterol because it clogs your arteries. It basically causes plaque buildup in your arteries. It narrows them. As a result, you're not getting as much blood flow to the brain. You're not getting as much oxygen to the brain, which of course is going to then subsequently impact your um, thinking and your risk for heart attack, stroke, et cetera. So if you have too much LDL, you can that turns into plaque and it builds up on your artery walls. And HDL cholesterol is good. It's the good cholesterol because it absorbs the LDL and it carries it back to the liver, which then gets flushed from the body. So there's kind of this ratio you want of low LDL to higher HDL. And these are some of the um, <clears throat> uh, things they have found with LDL on the risk for dementia. They really find that um, high LDL cholesterol seems to have more of an impact on your risk for dementia when you're in your midlife compared to older. So younger than 65, it seems to be very, very more important to control than when you, if you're older than 65, at least for risk for dementia. However, it's important to control anyway, because it is a risk factor for stroke and for beta amyloid and tau, which are neuropathological features of Alzheimer's. So it's not saying that you don't need to control these as you're older, but it seems like there's a stronger association when people are younger. These are some of the values recommended for cholesterol. Um, really, it's a discussion with your doctor. Um, my LDL was actually a little bit high at my last visit. My doctor wants me to try to control that with lifestyle changes and um, didn't want to put me on medication which I was very happy about because I don't really like medication, but I would have gone on it if she had recommended that I be on something. But she said, let's see how, how you do in controlling it. But these are some of the values with 160 and higher being dangerous. This range here, 100 to 159 being sort of at risk. That's not a great level. And then under 100 being ideal. But again, it really matters. And it's a discussion with your doctor, with your age, with your other risk factors of what they recommend um, you be on. And it really is a matter of lifestyle changes that ha can lower the LDL cholesterol. Um, Got to avoid the fatty foods and eat a healthy diet. What we teach at the um, empowerment program is the MIND diet, um, rich and fruity fruits and leafy vegetables and, um, you know, high in fish, low in saturated fats. Um, of course, exercise is important. Smoking, um, being a former smoker was one of the hardest things I ever gave up, but much healthier as a result of no longer smoking. Taking prescription medications. Um, as I said, you know, of course, that could be something your doctor may recommend. And finally, uh, reducing stress levels. Now, the final thing to you about is alcohol. And as I saw wine with dinner, when they go out with friends, um, what, what's the uh, bottom line about this? Um, you know, drinking is a social activity. It's a part of our, uh, you know, experience of being with friends, of celebrations, of 
And um, is it important to just completely cut it out or can you modify? I think the literature seems to suggest that modification is okay. So there's a lot of individual variation in how alcohol influences cognition. And the literature is pretty messy because sometimes we're getting people's self-report of alcohol use in studies. And, you know, it's true with cigarettes. I remember the doctor would say, how, <clears throat> how much do you smoke? And of course, I'd always say less than I did. So it's kind of hard to measure <clears throat> factors like genetics, health, and drinking patterns definitely play a role. So what the literature suggests is that high levels of alcohol consumption, more than 14 units, and I'll describe what that means, a week, are consistently linked to an increased risk of dementia. So they're recommending less than 14 units per week as being something that may be manageable, but not more. <clears throat> and these are units. So here you see this slide. It shows you um, different examples. So a small, a normal beer, a half a pint, or a single spirit shot, vodka shot, whatever, is one unit. You know, a small glass of wine, five ounces of wine counts for 1.5 units. But as you get, you get offered, would you like to um, supersize that at the by the waitress to nine ounces, you're going to go up three units. So you have to kind of gauge, um, you drink a whole bottle of vodka, 30 units. So they have different unit um, definitions for different uh, drinks of how much, what's a good, what's a good gauge of how much you're drinking. So what's the connection between alcohol and cognition? Well, first of all, we know that alcohol has neurotoxic effects on the brain. It causes functional, um, structural and functional brain damage, particularly to areas such as the uh, frontal lobes involved in executive functioning and the temporal lobes involved in memory. It sort of goes to those regions. So too much alcohol is gonna damage your brain. It also can have indirect effects via nutritional deficiencies or liver dysfunction. We know, for example, that there's a thiamine vitamin B1 deficiency in chronic alcoholics that causes them to get Wernicke's or Korsakoff's dementia. And so too much alcohol can cause severe vitamin deficiencies. And we also know that alcohol can be bad if you have a lot of vascular disease. Um, for example, if you're on blood thinners, you're told not to drink because alcohol itself acts as a blood thinner. So you have to be careful as well about drinking. You know, there's a big thing, and I'm, I'm asked as well about, well, what about red wine? There's some notion, um, well, not notion, there's some evidence suggesting that red wine is the healthier of the wines to drink if you're going to drink wine. And here are some examples of wine, red wine for your health. Um, Malbec has something, uh, and uh, you could see Barbera. I'm not sure what that is. I've not ever had it, but resveratrol is um, one of the ingredients in some of the red wines, and they inhibit beta amyloid production. So these can be helpful in reducing some neuropathological changes associated with Alzheimer's. They also are involved in reducing neuroinflammation of neurons and cells in your brain. Also, the uh, flanavoids, uh, flavonoids, sorry, they reduce brain death, oxidative stress. So there are some benefits to uh, drinking some of the red wines, Pinot Noir um, and Cabernet are some of the ones, and Malbec are the ones that I'm most familiar with. But um, I will often uh, go in favor of a red wine at dinner, not, be not because I like them, not so much. Uh, for other reasons, but they do have some sort of a neuroprotective effect as well, if you're concerned about drinking and cognition. <clears throat> so I just wanted to conclude with letting you know that I started out with this history of my, my experience at Emory and really, um, you know, our view of aging has really changed over the years. Um, back in the 1900s, it was assumed that if you lived long enough, you were going to become senile. There was no other option that's going to happen. 
And then in the 1970s, dementia was considered a separate from normal aging. And it was realized that that was one path versus the other path of normal aging. And now we know that there are many different trajectories of aging. Normal aging, mild cognitive impairment, dementia are all different ways that a person can go as they get older. What we're trying to do with all of these lifestyle interventions and some of the ones that I mentioned today are to increase our reserve. So if you look here, the black line is what happens with the year, increased years. There's some change in cognitive function as we get older. We become a little bit slower in thinking. We have a little bit more trouble maybe coming up with words or remembering something. We may not totally forget it. it takes us a while to get to it. But what we want to do is get this green bar up here, this green curve. We want to increase our brain reserve, our cognitive reserve through lifestyle changes so that we can go for a longer age before we start to show any decline at that yellow dotted line. That's the whole point of what we're doing with these lifestyle interventions and what the Cognitive Empowerment Program is really all about. Finally, um, the Lancet said that although addressing risk factors in an early stage of life is desirable, there is also a benefit from tackling risk throughout life. It is never too early or too late to reduce dementia risk. This is really important because some of the things I've mentioned or you've seen on the slide, like education show early in life, education being important. Well, education is important at all stages of life and cognitive stimulation and anything, courses you take, learning a new language, learning a piano, whatever you do to challenge your mind, for example, is considered education. Never too late to start uh, implementing some of these um, lifestyle changes. And with that, I'll stop and see if we have any questions or any comments from people. Um, if you could also describe maybe your own experiences um, if you've done any of the things that we've talked about, for example, getting a hearing aid, um, you know, anything like that, has it made a difference in your life? That would be, I think, helpful for others to hear, because that's one of the things that people don't want to get, you know, a hearing aid. It's just, they don't want to go for an audiological appointment. I understand it. I mean, there's, I guess it's hard to accept that you need, you know, to, to wear something, but it, it makes such a difference. And it's such an easy fix. And they're so tiny now. I just saw a friend um, I, I started at Emory with in the elevators, actually a little bit older than me. And he told me he wears hearing aids. I didn't even see them in him. I, I said, where? And they're so, you know, anyway, I'll shut up and let you guys um, talk a bit. That's so true, Dr. Goldstein. We hear all the time that our members and care partners in the program have gone to the appointments, they've gotten the memory, or not the memory, the, the hearing aids, and their care partners are trying to get them to wear them, that they're in the drawer somewhere, and there's some sort of refu refusal somewhere along the way of wanting to wear the devices. And like you're saying, they are so small now. We've seen them yeah. that they're barely detectable. Yeah. There's so much new technology out there. If you've been not wearing yours because you have the the older, larger sets, go mm -hmm. get a new appointment. Costco. See what the new ones are. Yeah, That's Costco. Told me. He said Costco is the best place. They're the least expensive there and they're excellent. He said you do a great job. And he had short hair. I mean, I really did not see them on him. And I was, I had my glasses on, so I didn't realize he had them. So hot off the press, go to Costco, get your hearing aids. And if you're a care partner who's been struggling to get your companion to wear them, remind them about how this can really improve their cognition. Like Dr. Goldstein said, up to like 46% in some yeah, folks, huge. which is incredible. And maybe even better results than you might see getting on a medication or something like that. That 46% is a huge leap for just wearing the hearing aids. And it sounds like we're getting a lot of response in the chat that yes, my husband um, has got his hearing aids from Costco. It made oh, such good. a difference for him. 
one of our care partners said, any suggestions to get them to use the hearing aids? You know, remind them of the statistics, remind them you can go get an updated care if they need, but do you have any other reminders for somebody who might be resistant that you might tell a care partner in clinic for someone who's having the same issue? Yeah, I think, um, I think even, you know, not, you don't have to wear them all the time. Maybe you could just bargain, you know, let's do it like we're going out socially or with, we're, we're with the kids at a party and, um, you know, it's really important. So maybe that kind of an approach, like you don't need to wear them all the time. I'm not saying that. When we're together one-on-one, -on -one, it's fine, but in a party, in a, you know, something or something's really important. If you go to the doctor's office, could you please wear them to make sure you hear what the doctor's telling you? That kind of thing may be a good bargaining kind of way to put it. Um, so absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I reminded them of those special occasions. And yeah. one of the things we got in the chat too is, um, use your insurance. That's one of the right. things that's, you know, if your insurance covers it, if the money is there and if it's not, maybe explore some alternative places like Costco and places like that. Cause like you're saying, there's a lot of new technology out there. That's a lot cheaper than it used to be. That definitely. And I'm wondering if DP meant, um, oh, Companies have twenty five hundred dollar coverage. I thought maybe um, DP was also referring to um, losing your hearing aids because that could that can happen too, mm -hmm. um, especially if you're having some memory problems. So and they're expensive, so maybe for insurance to cover the cost of losing them would be important to have as well. I think that's a good good advice. Yeah, and it's not just the hearing aids, like you said. It's also the glasses being able to see things around you fully so if you have that person in your life who's been hesitant to wear their glasses out or put put that pair in their purse for when you go out to the movies or out to read the menu at dinner mm -hmm. remind them of the cognitive benefits of using these very helpful aids and devices mm -hmm. And I've seen people like it, you know, I I also I have a clinic, a memory clinic. I've seen people come in with the coolest glasses. They could be such fun. Um, she had two different uh frames and one pair of glasses. One was like oct octagon and one was a square. And it was very cool. And I said to her, uh, did you mean to do that? And she said, Yes. I mean, but they could be a statement, a fashion statement. So, you know, you can really have fun with eyeglasses today. They're not the clunky ones from years ago and they're colorful and fun and really dress up an outfit. So that can be, be a fashion statement too. Yep. We got some good comments in the chat for people who've almost lost their hearing aids that they have a find my hearing aid feature. Now you can even oh. locate your hearing aids through oh. Bluetooth and other things like that. So that is a really good, um, really hot That's tip a, coming to us from our viewers so in the chat. We also had some comments about how the phones now connect Bluetooth directly to your phone, to your hearing aids. So a lot of our participants are connecting their phones to their hearing aids and they're not struggling to hear calls and hear their phones because the sound from even YouTube on their phones is going directly into their hearing aids. So we love to hear all of our folks that are getting into technology and being able to still enjoy things like their favorite music and their programs mm -hmm. through their ear devices. And you also mentioned these LDL cholesterols, which a lot of folks, I think, think about cholesterol levels when they think about heart health, but aren't necessarily thinking about it as much with their brain health. Mm -hmm. And what we have encouraged our participants at CEP to keep in mind is that when your blood's pumping through your body, it's also pumping through your brain. So keeping in mind all those heart health things. I'm curious if you've ever seen in clinic and any of your patients, any big turnarounds or improvements from any of these lifestyle changes like for working on your cholesterol or getting your vision or even working on your alcohol consumption, if you've seen that make a really big impact mm -hmm. directly in some of the folks that you have seen in clinic. Well, I, I it's hard to say because I, I, I really, to be honest, I mean, I usually see people at, you know, initially, and then maybe a few, few years later. So it, I, I don't, necessarily see it immediately but i know that there there has to be an improvement and just in your general health if your cholesterol is better 
controlled, you're feeling better, you're probably exercising more, you're eating better. There's so many more things that go into just the cholesterol. Your lifestyle is healthier. So definitely you would expect to see improvement in that person. Um, and we just want to yeah. acknowledge all of you at home who have done things like changed your alcohol habits or changed your smoking habits or changed the food that you're preparing and eating, mm -hmm. because truly that is such a huge hurdle to even approach. And sometimes there can be so much fear and anxiety even wrapped up in making some of these small changes. But it's nice to know that the Lancet is reflecting that when you put that effort in, when you go through that almost grueling process of making those changes sometimes that the payoffs for our cognitive health are really there on the other side of that effort. Yeah. So we've and got some folks. Thing. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, go I ahead. One more thing. And I know we're focusing on hearing aids because that really is a, was surprising to me when I first learned that. The other thing to get someone to wear them is to have them think about the impact on other people like their kids or you, you know, if they're not here, it's frustrating. It's hard for the kid, for your kids if they feel like you're not really able to hear what they're telling you. And so I think putting it the other way as well about how it might benefit the other person could also be something that might, might get them to do it rather than the benefit to themselves, the benefit to other people when they are wearing the hearing aids. That's another thought I had. Yeah, absolutely. And we had some questions in the chat for those who do have hearing loss and wear hearing aids that want to know, you know, or is wearing my hearing aids going to affect my chances of getting dementia? And it's within all those things we were talking about earlier. It's not just collecting and hearing more data and information, but it's also in those relationships that you have with the people around you and being able to fully engage in them. Oh fully hear information so that you can recall it earlier in another setting or another phone call and not just be able to say that, yes, it helps your cognitive health, but we know that that social and that uh, okay. network of support is such a big part of cognitive health. Exactly. Yes, it has wide ranging impacts on so many other fat features that are, are related to developing cognitive impairment. Yep. And you've shared with us so many times before that that isolation, we, we experienced this so much in that COVID period of everything being shut down, but being separate from our loved ones and our social communities really truly does have a huge impact on our cognitive health. Absolutely. That was the one thing I hear a lot from people who came in, how the person, their loved one that seemed to be defining so much because they were just so isolated and they really noticed that difference. Yeah. So those in the 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 Q and A that asked a little bit about wearing those hearing aids and and really being someone who has severe hearing loss, um, will it affect your chances of getting dementia? Wearing those devices absolutely will improve that. If you've had any doubt about it, or you've been arguing with your loved one about it, uh, rest assured that it will be something to support you on your brain health journey uh, more than anything else. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this has been a really enlightening um, session today, Dr. Dr. Goldstein. I feel like we talk so much about diet and exercise and things like that, that we're really not considering the impact of some of these simple changes that you've mentioned today. And they just can have huge payoffs according to the research. Absolutely, yeah. So we've got some more comments about uh, different ways to, um, keep our hearing aids especially when we were wearing a mask and things like that really? they really have been a hot topic today and maybe this is something that we can come back and revisit at another point in time yeah. talking a little bit more about hearing and cognition mm -hmm. next month in the month of october we're going to be talking about busting brain myths we're going to mm -hmm. be talking about a lot of simple myths that you might have heard i feel like we busted a lot of myths in today's session but we're also going to be coming back with another one of our neuropsychological, our, our neuro, neuropsychology interns next month, uh, or postdoc, I think, uh, folks, that's going to be talking about more of these brain myths. So bring your questions with you. We'll get a little bit more into maybe talking about 
hearing a little bit more in depth in some of our future sessions. We've got some occupational therapists on our staff that might really enjoy diving deeper into this topic. So we'll share that with them. And thank you so much, Dr. Goldstein, for putting Absolutely. all of this information and research together. It has been invaluable from your perspective, especially putting it in the context of the larger framework of what's happened in the past 10, 15, 20 years in all the research that's come out around things like mild cognitive impairment, lifestyle research. Thank you. Well, we'll see everybody back next week. Hopefully you'll all come back wearing your hearing aids, wearing your glasses for next week's session. We'll set ourselves up for success and we'll make small commitments to prioritize doing that during those big important moments with our friends and family and making sure that we're continuing to connect with each other as we continue to do this brain health journey together. So thank you all so much. Thank you for your expertise. And we'll come back next week with a little get active session and round out with some Tai Chi at the end of the month, everybody. Thank you so much for tuning in today. Thank you. Bye.